All right, so the end result of this one, and I don't think we even filled out a paper on this one, did we yet? Yeah, no. I'm wrong. All right. And then our learning objectives. Do we want to build five unique buildings? And I'm just putting not all the same. That way you get the idea that they're not all the same. It's not like you've duplicated one building and then just changed you know, how many windows that specific building has. You, you have basically five unique buildings. Um, <clears throat> um, we're using ambient occlusion for our rendering. And luminance for our materials. And just so you can see what that entails, uh, let me turn off my big cloner. Remember when we set this up to render, we gave all the materials, except for something like glass or something that's transparent um, or shiny. Uh, for the most part, everything has just this flat color to it. So the building is a flat color, this lamp is a flat color, this is a solid white. And then there's no real lights in the scene at all. All of our shading is coming from that render settings. We added that ambient occlusion. So that's where all of our shading comes from. So as long as you have those two things on there, then that meets that qualification. Um, use of cloners to duplicate buildings and props. create five different camera effects. And this is part of what we're going to be getting into today. Do, 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 do. camera effects. And then Combining images inside of Photoshop. Photoshop. All right, so that's the gist of what we're going to be um, accomplishing. Um, there's no planning for this one, so you can skip the planning section. For this one, I want your project folder, and I want everything. Yeah, well, check project folder, and then check everything. Oh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> no, just that one. And then you'll be turning in a, um, you'll be turning in six still images. And there will be five individual and one combined. And what we're going to do is, um, for this one, we're going to render out six different camera angles or six different effects and camera angles um, inside of our city. That way we can show off the details of it. Um, so you'll have basically five different images of that. One of your images will be all those five images combined in like a strip, OK? So the one combined is pretty easy. Um, the resolution for the images uh, is 3,000 pixels by 2,400 pixels uh, for the individual. So if you want to put individual, there we go, individual. And then for the big image, 3,000 is the width, right? Okay, so 3,000 times 5. Oh, 15,000. Yep. 
by 2400. All right, so this is something that usually makes, um, obviously it's a good learning exercise too because we're gonna go through different things you can do with your cameras. Cameras in the digital world are very similar to cameras in the real world. It's just a matter of setting them up to act the same way. Um, the good thing is we don't have to pay for lenses, so pretty much whatever we wanna set them up to, we can. Um, so we'll be playing with that. Um, and then you get these still images that are good because you may like one camera view or another camera view that you, know, you think is really awesome. And then the strip is good because then you can see all the shots kind of side by side. It's really neat um, to see. Um, class name and number is MACA 2510. Introduction to 3D. And then let's see our points on this one. Uh, 16 points, boom. Yeah, it doesn't actually matter um, because we're not, in this case, we're not printing them. Yeah. But if we were going to print them, then it would. Okay. But we would still do the same resolution. And this, the 3000 by 2400 basically gives us an 8 by 10. We can stretch it a little bit, but yeah. Uh, and then remember too, so the way that the these sheets work is when you turn in your assignment you give me the sheet with it that way I know to grade it I have a little folder in my thing that I'm organizing the stuff with I go through I'm gonna grade it I'll mark up any stuff that's wrong um, anything that's you know if there's nothing wrong then you will get obviously full points I hand you back the paper you look at it and say I'm satisfied with the points and you sign it and you turn it in if you're not satisfied with the points you fix the stuff up you uh, um, turn in a resubmit form and then you give me that with this and then I go back and I recheck it, okay? But if I don't get the form back, I don't put it in the, into the system. Cool. Any questions on the assignment submission form yet? No. Cool. All right, now we'll get into the assignment. Let's see. All right, so the first thing we want to cover is how do we get the street look? Okay, so I'm going to go and start turning off my cloners. What you'll find is that the, the more stuff you have going on your scene, the slower it's going to go. So if I turned on, like right now, if I spin around my scene, it's going pretty quick. Not extremely quick, but it's going quick enough. Yes, sir? Do you want me to close all my cloners or all my windows? No, just take notes now. I'll show you. <clears throat> you'll do this later. Okay. If I go and I add the first cloner in there that clones all the buildings, now it's going a bit slower. If I clone this again, it takes a few minutes for it to load up. But now as I start to, to tumble around my scene, look at how slow it's going. It's not even refreshing any of the geometry. It's just showing me it basically in this like wireframe mode until I let go of the mouse and then it shows me it. So this is one of the advantages of using a cloner versus duplicating stuff because if I were to duplicate all these, there's no way for me to turn off those duplicates without just hiding all the duplicates and that is harder to do than me just clicking the single button, okay? So you wanna use cloners for this very same reason. All right, so that's beautiful. All right, so let's turn that off and then we'll do, I'll turn this one off too. Oh, that's my building. Okay, so I'll leave that there. All right, so first thing, let's get the grid. I'll get the grid set up, okay? So um, here are my sidewalk blocks. Now this is done the exact same way that the buildings were done. All I did was I created one cube and then I put it into a cloner, okay? So I'll disable the cloner so you can see that this is just one cube. And all I did to the cube was I just beveled it. So it looks like there's kind of a curb there and then it's kind of sitting in the ground. That's all I did, okay? 
So to create your little sidewalk block, that's what you do. You make one of them, make it rounded, and then you can drop it into a cloner. <clears throat> the cloner I have set up to be a grid. There's three going left and right. There's three going up and down. Um, there's one in the Y direction, because I don't need any going, obviously, this direction. That wouldn't make sense. There's only one in that direction. And then for the size, I just sized it up until it matched that little plane that we already set up before. Okay, so these numbers are going to be different for yours. I basically just wanted to get it so that they were sitting inside this area. Now, if you get it here, like that seems like this is a good amount of space. Let's pretend that, where is my cube instancer flag? There it is. Let's pretend that this thing was huge, like this and like that. Okay, as this gets bigger, what I don't want to do is then take my sidewalk blocks and then start to stretch it out to that because now my roads are like ridiculously big. Okay, I'm focusing on how big should the roads be. The roads should be roughly that size. Looking at the buildings, <clears throat> looking at their proportions, looking at how big um, this gap is, that's all I'm doing. Okay, just like when you draw something, you kind of eyeball where the stuff is. Then once I get that, then I can just go back to that original shape, and then I can resize this so that it fits that more appropriately. And this, we're not going to see the edges too much, so I'm not even concerned about like stretching it out or, you know, even if there's like a gap on the sides of this, I'm not concerned about that. I just want to have something here so that when I'm in these views like this, that it doesn't look like it just stops and does nothing, that there's something else kind of out there, okay? So that's all I did to create these little blocks. Now, when I did <clears throat> my lights, I did the stop signs, I did whatever. All of the stop signs and stuff, I started off with cloning, and then I went and instanced the clones, okay? So if I go to my stop sign group here, oops, you'll see all the stop signs that are right there, okay? Now, the way that stop signs work is they're typically going to be, if I'm in the right lane, which is typically how we drive in America, it's going to be on the end of the sidewalk, right? It won't be at the start of the sidewalk. It'll be at the end of it because that's typically you get to the corner and there's where that stop sign is. So when I placed my first stop sign right here, I'll unsolo this so we can see it, I placed it right at the corner. And then I was able to, um, um, for this, you could clone it because it's not that much uh, geometry, or you could instance it. So I instanced it and do, moved it back. And I instanced it and moved it back, OK? Then once I had that group, let me solo this again so we can see it. Once I had this group, then I could duplicate it. Now, because I used a cloner in the first place to create all these grids, all the grids are evenly placed. So now it's just a matter of going to my um, instance, and then I can just instance this and move it over to that side. And then I can create another instance and rotate it around and move it to where that one needs to be. Okay. Just make sure that anytime you're rotating any of this stuff that you do use a shift key to snap it in alignment, okay? So for something like that, you could use instance or you could use the cloner because it's not heavy geometry, right? Um, there's also, if we look at my stop sign here, the way that I created the stop sign was I started with a cap to a cylinder. That's all I did. Or they actually have a disc shape. You can do it either way. So there's a disc. Like that. And if I reduce the number of divisions to eight, there's my stop sign. And then I just have to color this outside um, area just with the white. And because we want to keep this as um, small as possible, I actually brought the disc segments down to two. Oops, two. And then I can just grab this edge there 
goes. And then scale it out. And however far I scale it out, that's the thickness of that white border. Okay. And then it's just a matter of positioning it in, you know, where I want it. Putting a pole right here. And the pole is just a cube <clears throat> where I deleted the top of it. So you can see there's a little bit of a gap here in the bottom. Let's make sure there's a gap between these things too. So I don't really have to fix that because you're not going to see it, but something to be aware of. Uh, the way I created these light posts is in the same way, um, the same way we've done other stuff. I started with a basic shape. So in this case, I believe I started with a um, cylinder. No, I started with a cube. Yeah, I did. There he is. So I started with a cube, and then I just started extruding to create that shape. So I extruded it up. I extruded it in. I extruded it up. And when I got to the top here, I just extruded that point out and then extruded down. Okay. So now watch how I can do that with a cube. I'm not going to do it to size or anything. I'll just do it way over here. As you start modeling things, it's basically just about breaking down the surfaces, breaking down the shapes. So let's say this is the base of our light. So I'm going to hit C and go to my faces. And I'm just going to extrude inner because that's where the pole is going to come out. I'm going to extrude up. And we'll just pretend that that's a good height for the pole. I'm going to use my edge loop uh, cut. And I'm going to specify where I want the pole to come out, where I want the light to come out of. And then I can extrude this out. OK, so that's the shape I've created so far. And then I'm going to use my edge loop here to say where I want the light to come out of. I switch back to the Move tool. Uh, I extrude, come on, down. I'm going to scale it out a bit, extrude it down a little bit, extrude it in, and extrude it up. Okay. Now, you don't have to remember every single, like, you did this, this, this. Just go in there and play with it. Figure out how to look at those shapes. The way that I approach any kind of learning is it's like a video game. Um, when you get a video game, you don't look at the instruction manual first, or you don't go online and read how to play the game. You just get in there and start playing, and eventually you figure out how to do those things. So knowing that I started with a cube, you at least have a starting point. Knowing how I extruded in here and up there, that's how I did it. Every time I change direction, I have to do a different extrude. So going in is one extrude. Coming up is another extrude. Now for this light pole, I could have, instead of going all the way to the top here, I could have gone and just pretend that I didn't do this part already. I could have extruded here and then extruded there, and that would have also given me that distance. And then I could have pulled this face out for the light pole. Okay, instead of using the loop, that's another way you could do it. Okay, now once I have this, if I go and subdivide it, it's going to look really ugly, <laughs> like really ugly. So in order to keep the shape, I have to use edge loops at certain spots. So I use edge loops anywhere I want to hold the shape. So watch here how round that gets. If I use an edge loop right here and right here and right here, at these three spots where I don't want to go crazy smooth, and then I put it on, look at how nicely it smooths it. Okay, It's adding a little bit of a bevel, of a bevel to it. Edge loop. edge loop. So you hit K and then you go to L for loop or knife loop or whatever you want to call it. I call it edge loop because that's a, what we're doing. So a lot of times you're going to hit, you know, go to that subdivision surface and then hit undo. And then, especially down here in the bottom, there should be another division here, another division there, and another division. Come on. There. So now there's my light pole. Now, before I go and duplicate these around or clone these around, obviously I want to make sure the materials are on there. So I grab the faces for all those things, 
Okay, and now you don't do it in subdivision mode because it doesn't allow you to do that in subdivision mode. I have to go to the cube, the original cube, and this is going to make your job easier because it's just the cube. And then you just grab the faces. So you can do this a number of ways. Typically, I will use the rectangle select and then use the control key to deselect the stuff I don't want. And then I can just drop on, here is my, uh, I think I use sidewalk on that part. And then I can use select invert, and that will select everything else. And then I can just deselect this lamp. And then that was lamp, or no, that was aluminum. And then for this one, that was my um, lamp material. Okay. And then when I turn that subdivision surface back on, boom. Now you'll see that some of that um, top part here, my lamp material actually like bled right back onto it. So I just uncheck the box. <coughs> I put another edge loop in, let's say, right here, come on, and then I can check it and say, yep, that's good enough, okay? The idea with this is that it's stylized, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Eventually, we'll get into more concrete, like this is where the stuff should be modeled and how it should be set up, okay? So now once I have this, I need to then duplicate it around my surface. Now here's where it can get tricky, because if you look at my light here, this is, let me delete, or um, just ignore that for a second. Here's my light group, so here's all my lights. If you look inside here, you'll see I have a cloner instance, I have a cloner, a null, a cloner instance, a cloner, a subdivision surface, and then a cube, okay? So this is where we're at with this one, is we've created the single cube, and then subdivided it so that it's smooth. That's all we've done. Now we need to clone it. Because of how these grids are set up, the way that I do it is I just, I do one right here. So this little four strip, that's one cloner right there. And then to create the next one, I can instance because it's already set up. And then to create the next one, I can instance that, okay? I'll show you a couple different ways to do it. So don't think that the only way that I'm doing it is the only way it can be done. It can be done 20 different ways, or six maybe. So I'm going to clone it. Okay, I don't want to go in the um, Y direction, so I turn that off. I want to go in the Z direction, so I'm going to pull this up. And then basically what I'm going to do is um, get it in position. So just pretend that I don't have those other ones in there. I'm going to get this roughly in position right there. It needs to be scaled down. The cloner does allow me to scale from here, um, but your best thing to do is to go back to that original shape, your original cube, and scale from there. Because you can see what it's doing differently is it's not scaling the whole group down, it's just scaling the one item down um, individually. Okay. So there's my cloner, really small, that I can go back to the, real, the original cloner and then just choose that distance, okay? So let's say I want them this far apart. I want four of them in a block. Perfect, there we go. So now I have one block set up. Now I need to create one for this block and one for that block. So I could instance, just go to this thing, go to instance, and it will instance, copy that original one and keep it connected. Again, that's something you can do. Um, I could also drop this into a cloner, so I'll show both ways. So here's the cloner. So there's a cloner and a cloner. And I'll set this up as a, uh, well, linear should be fine. Okay, I'm gonna turn that off. I'm gonna go in the Z direction. If you're not sure which direction, try one. If that's not it, try the other one. There we go. Okay, so this is the nice thing about the cloner is that I'm just punching in values. It's like, how far are these apart? This grid is already set up, so that should be perfect. And there we go. Now to get this onto, let's say, this one, I could then go through and clone it again. 
Um, I could also try doing a grid and seeing if I can duplicate it with a grid this way. That's way too many that way. I'm going to say, well, I want one in this direction. I'm going to move this to the center. And then remember with the grid one, you get these dots. So I could just pull this out like this and pull that out like that. Okay, so I line it up. Back. Okay, so then I could take this and then I could duplicate it or instance it and then rotate it around or whatever. Okay, so that's how you will do your lights. Now, once you understand how the instancing works, once you understand how the cloning works, the buildings are no different. Okay, so I showed in one of the videos um, where are my buildings at? Oh, I also have road lines here too, which are just pieces of geometry, just so you can see it. So this is a cube that I just colored yellow and then did the same instancer little tricks. You'll also notice that there's no lines at the intersections. Typically there's no lines at the intersections in the center. They stop like right there, okay? Depending on how much detail you wanna get, you can play with that further. But again, it's just a cube instance to create those shapes where I need them. Um, flags, cube, cloning, there we go. All right. <clears throat> so what I did was I created one block inside my area here. So I went to my um, buildings that I had, and then I put them all into a cloner and that created one block of buildings, okay? Now you'll notice that there is, um, this building is differently rotated than that building. If I go under my effectors, I have this thing called a formula. And the cool thing about cloners, and we'll get more into this in our next assignment, which is our title, is that you can actually have something cloned or duplicated or whatever, and then you can affect it on a bigger scale. Uh, let me show you that in a separate scene, just so you can see this. So here's a cube. Oops. What are you doing? There we go. All right. Uh, I'm going to go and clone this, just like we've done before. I'm going to set this up into a grid. That's not grid, is it? Into a grid. There we go. And I will make this enormously big like this, and enormously big like that, and enormously big like this. Okay. So this is pretty much a perfect grid of cubes. And then just to emphasize that more, let's add some more. And again, this is the benefit of using cloners, is that if we were to try to instance one cube and do that with it, it would take us forever to get them all evenly spaced, okay? Especially for the next part, it wouldn't be even possible. So I'm gonna go to the cloner, or under the MoGraph and under Effector, and here's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do to this specific cube. So I'm gonna go to this one that says random, and what you'll see is instead of all the cubes being perfectly in a grid, now they're a bit random. And if we go to the effector for that, or the parameters for this, we can choose where it's random. So right now it's random in the position. So I'm gonna turn position off and I'm gonna turn on, let's say, scale. So now just by changing the scale values, now I have this, which is like, that's pretty awesome. Right? And then I can even go to rotate and say 50, 50, 50. And then I can also go to position and I could say, you know, 500, 500, 500. Okay, and now we have all this huge mess laying around. Now what's even cooler about this is that we could then animate this whole effect coming on and going off. So instead of this effector, this, this random being all over the place, I can go to the fall off and I can make a box and now whatever is inside the box is affected. So if I go like this, I can actually animate the stuff breaking apart and coming back together. Our next assignment is doing this stuff, okay? Where we take a word, we break it apart, and then we bring it back, or we, it's already broken apart, we bring it back together, okay? So you can do a lot of cool stuff with this, just this kind of thing. Um, cloners is one of the big, big, big advantages of using Cinema versus other programs because some other programs don't have 
as quickly as I was able to do that, they don't have that, okay? So the way that these buildings are rotated is done with an effector called a formula. And the way that it works is I click on that cloner, I go under MoGraph, I go to effector, and I click on formula. Now this is where if you were um, inclined to, you could really get into creating a massive world that has so much more stuff in it. You could even get into changing the size of your buildings so that let's say one building is smaller and, and Cinema would actually update how many windows there are. That's beyond our second assignment, okay? But you could, you could really do that. Uh, with this formula, um, where did I put the formula effector? Um, I did not know this formula when I first did this. I knew this was something that I wanted to do, and so I had to Google it and I had to look it up to see how do I do this. So what I did is I added that uh, formula effector, and then under the effector tab under formula, I found this little expression. Okay, now what this does is it makes sure that when the buildings rotate, that they don't rotate at like a 22 degree angle because no building is at a 22 degree angle. They're typically in 90 degree increments, okay? So if you wanted to do this for yours, you don't have to, it looks, can look better, you would type that in. So it's just round parentheses, RND parentheses five, semicolon, one, two, three, five, five. And from what I remember, this one, two, three, five, five is a random number that you could change to anything and it would just update that value, okay? So we'll, we'll test it out in a second once you're done copying it down. Okay, good? All right. uh, so if I go here to the one, two, three, five, five and I change it to one, two, two, five, five, you'll see that some of my buildings rotated, okay? There's a bit of randomness, which is what that RND is doing. It's, it's basically like a randomizer, but it's rounding it to those increments. So every time we go to a different number here, let me jump back to my other one that I have. Um, okay, so you see how these things are, are randomly positioned and scaled and rotated. There's actually like a list of random numbers that it's pulling from. That's called the seed. And if we go to the seed right here and I change that, it'll change the positions, the rotations, and the scales. It's still keeping the same amount of, of position, rotate, and scale, but it's just basically choosing a different number, okay? So that's what that is doing, is just changing what the seed value is. So in this case, these two buildings are identical now, so I may want to go back to the other one or try a different number. Like, maybe that's a good number, not the divide sign. That's bad there. All right, so that's sufficient. Okay, now the disadvantage of this is my front door, which was right here, is now over there. It worked out perfectly. It could have ended up way back here, but it worked out good. Cool. Um, all right, so once I have all my buildings in that block, and I've cloned them so that they're kind of random, I just put them inside of another cloner, just like I did these blocks, just like I did my lights, just like I did my um, lines here. And then I turn that cloner on. Okay, so it's just another grid cloner, that's all it is. And then now I have buildings all over the place. And again, this is why we don't wanna have this on all the time is because this is gonna seriously slow down how fast we're working. Now you'll see from above, it's exactly the same group, right, at each one. I could go into even this cloner here and I could add that formula. So let me go to my MoGraph, let me go to Effector, let me go to um, Formula. Actually, I can do this. Uh, I'm gonna go to this building, I'm gonna go to this Effector, and this is another great thing about Cinema, I can just drag that formula down into that Effector. And now it updates. Now you'll see the power of this if you are, um, like we talked about at the beginning, this class is for collaborative, it's for, um, older design students, it's for motion design, and it's for 3D. If you stick with 3D or motion design, you'll find a million different areas where people are using this kind of stuff um, all over the place. Um, even talking about some of the other things, Octane. Octane. Yes, sir. 
Okay, so clone one, clone nine buildings here. So you'll see I have a three by three grid, right? Three by three here. And then I have a bigger three by three for that one. Okay, so once you're at this point, I'm gonna turn off my all buildings just so I can actually like spin around my scene some. Then we're gonna play with some of the camera angles. So um, you can shoot some stuff from above. Okay, so you can do these from like up here if you want. Um, you can get down to street level. You can play with a variety of different um, angles inside of your view to create different looks, okay? Um, the idea is that we want to show off the coolness of our scene. Um, I'm just going to do a little quick render so we can see this. Um, you'll see that we have, you know, right now there's gray everywhere because my buildings aren't there but there's no um, sky, it's all just blackness back there. So I'm gonna add in a sky so I can see that. Um, under this little thing here is floor and then you'll see there's one called sky. So I'm gonna add in a sky. And then when I render now, I should get at least some color of a sky. There we go. And then um, the way that this is set up is that there's no parameters specifically on that. It's all based on the material. So if I created, I'll just use yellow uh, thing for now. If I drop this on there, that yellow one, you'll see my sky is then like this crazy yellow. That's ugly. So I'm gonna make a new material. I'm gonna call this sky material. Um, no reflection. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna use a gradient on this. And then if you look at a picture of a sky, have you guys checked out any of the fog this morning? That's crazy. Uh, sky. Right? Typically like this, it's dark blue and then light blue, dark blue and then light blue, stuff like that. So that's what I want to go with. I'm going to go with a darker blue. And on this side, I'll go with a lighter blue. Now, instead of me changing the white, I can actually just grab one of these colors and then just get rid of the white. Just drag it off. Right. Then I'll drop this on here and then I'll adjust it from there. All right. So right now the sky is probably not gradating the way that I want it to. Yep. So right now it's projecting as a sphere. Let me shrink this down. Uh, I'm going to say frontal. Okay, now it's gonna go sideways, so it's going from left to right. So you can see that's the same direction. So I'm gonna just change this to the V direction, and now it should go um, the opposite. Let me just switch this. There we go, cool. Now with it as frontal, what that means is as I get in here, you'll see that the sky never really changes. It's always in the same exact spot. And that's fine, that's exactly what I wanted to do. But now when I get into these kinds of views, this is going to look much more pleasant than just having blackness back there or having nothing back there, okay? If you want a night scene and you want to create little like, like actual like these lights are on kind of feel, you could darken the sky. You could add lights into these areas here and just duplicate the lights with it. That way you can create some like night scenes, which is again, could be a cool look. Um, you could just try it out and just see what it looks like too. Um, cool. All right. So I'm gonna pick a cool camera angle like this, okay? Now before I do any camera setup, I wanna create an actual camera because right now there's no camera in my list of things. It's just a, whatever I'm moving around, that's my, my default perspective. So I can't set keyframes, I can't lock it, I can't you know, do anything. So I'm gonna create a brand new camera and I'm gonna call this render cam. And under my render cam options, here's all these different things that we can play with. Now, every camera in 3D is different. So if I go to Maya, the camera is different than Cinema is different than Houdini is different than um, 3D Studio Max or whatever. Um, the central ideas behind them are still the same, but how you access things or different features that they have sometimes are in different spots, okay? So just so you can see um, this thing, this is a 360 camera. So if you've ever shot a uh, panoramic before, 
Um, how do you typically do it? Right, you go in a circle. You take one picture and then you scoot over and take another picture and take another picture all the way around. So this one is actually three cameras, three fisheye cameras in one. So I could just go click and then I have a panoramic, okay, and I could spin around it. Or I can shoot a video and now my video is a panoramic, which is, again, awesome. Now what the uh, panoramic would do on your, on your um, phone or on your regular camera, somewhere along the line it has to stitch everything together. This does all the stitching. So it, it shoots like a picture here, a picture there, and a picture here. And then it figures out where they overlap and it blends those edges together. It doesn't always do a perfect job depending on where you're shooting, but typically it is pretty, um, pretty good. Um, so things like that are inside of this software. It's just a matter of accessing those features. We're not doing that for this, but we, you could do that for other things, okay? So some basic things like the focal length. If you're unfamiliar with any of these terms too, feel free to Google them. Has anyone here not had the intro to photo class? Photography class? No, everyone has? Cool. So everyone knows what focal length is. All right, so the focal length, um, obviously we can set this to like 100, render our stuff out. And then that looks considerably different than if our focal length is set to, let's say, 20. And then we, oh. <laughs> yep. uh, I'm not actually in the camera. I did not click that button. There we go. <laughs> so there's 20. That's why I didn't update. There's 100. Oops. Okay. So the bigger the number, the closer we're going to be to our stuff. The smaller the number, the further away it's going to seem, or the more drastic our moves are going to be with the camera. Okay. But the, the neat thing with that, too, is that you can really make it look big. Like at 20, this building looks pretty big. If I set this to 100, the, the street seems a bit smaller, a bit more condensed, right? Like the end of the street is like right there. So you really can get a, um, some really cool effects just by playing with just one option, which is focal length. Um, so the first thing you want to do is just find a good, find a good starting point, okay? Because everything else that we're going to do is going to be based off of this one starting point, and then we're going to move from there. So my focal length, we're going to set it to, let's say, 20, because that looks pretty decent. Um, focus distance, we don't need to play with that yet. Okay, cool. So I like the way this is set up. I think I want to have a stop sign in my view, so I'm just going to scoot back a little bit like this. Okay. Now, what I would do is I would turn on my other view. So I would turn on my other buildings and then render. Because I'm lecturing about this, I don't want to turn on my other buildings and render because it's going to take my render a bit longer to do. Okay. Um, also, when we do our renderings, we have to make sure that our settings are all set up correctly. So what resolution are we rendering our stuff out at? Sorry, not the resolution, though, pixels, width, and height. Yep. Okay. So 3,000 by 2,400. Um, so I want to set that up so that it's good to go. I also need to go to my anti-aliasing. Remember our settings for making sure that things don't look like crap when it renders out. And I want to turn that to best. And that should be good. Okay. If I render this out, just so you can see it, and I'm not satisfied with, let's say, the amount of shadowing slash ambient occlusion, or if my building is floating, or if anything like this building looks like it's floating, so I definitely need to scoot that down a bit. And to scoot it down, I need to go all the way back to my original building. So here's all buildings. Here's my cloner. Here's my tall, wide building. I believe that's that one. Nope, that is not the tall, wide building. That is my tall building. Yep. So I need to take my tall building and just scoot him down just a hair. There it goes. So now we should be grounded. Okay. So if I don't like the amount of ambient occlusion shadowing on here, I can adjust that inside this as well. So if I take this ray length down, let's say I take it to 20, 
that's going to basically, instead of this like spreading out from here to 100 units or looking 100 units to find something, it'll like tighten it up. So we'll see what that looks like in here. Now, my original renderings, which were here, look at my render time, six seconds for that one frame. OK, that's not too bad. Now that we've taken our, our anti-aliasing settings up and we've taken the resolution up, this image is now taking a minute to render for the one frame. OK, so the higher our resolution, the more stuff we have on there, the longer it's going to take. OK. So now I can compare between the two. Like here it is at 100, here it is at 20. I think that's where I set it to. Yep. Um, so I can decide do I like it like this, where I get more shadowing in these areas, or do I prefer it like that, where the, sh the ambient occlusion is a bit tighter? Okay. Um, I think that looks a bit more pleasant than this. Right? I like that. All right. So I'm going to stick with the 20. Um, if I get a lot of grain, which I'm not, it's not grainy at all, actually. Um, if I'm getting a lot of grain, I could take my samples up here. So instead of this being 64, I would just double it 128. Okay. Um, everything else looks good. Okay. So the only thing we changed is we changed our output to 3,000 by 2,400. We went to our anti-aliasing, changed that to best, and then I tweaked this just so I can see. You know what does that look like? Cool. All right. So I would turn on all my buildings. I would render. Uh, render picture viewer, there we go. So imagine that all my buildings have shown up here. I'm satisfied with the way this one looks. I would go to file and I would save this image as um, a TIFF, eight bits per channel. Everything else should be good. And then I will put that inside my renders and say Sarcona plane perspective zero one. Okay, so this is just the plane rendering. That's all it is. We've adjusted our focal length, we found a cool angle, and we rendered it out. There's shot one. Okay, now remember my buildings are off. You will have all your buildings on so that you can see all the buildings. It doesn't look like a weird ghost town. All right, so then that's camera one. Now I don't want to lose camera one. If I need to come back and fix something, I don't want to lose what I've done here. So I'm going to duplicate this. And I'm going to start renaming these. So this is um, plain perspective. That's what that first one is. My next one will be um, DOF render. Okay, DOF stands for depth of field. I could find a different angle if I want to, or I can use the same camera angle. For the sake of speediness, I'm going to use the same camera angle. Okay. The idea with depth of field is that we want to show off depth of field. We want to see blurriness and sharpness. Depth of field. Like that. What century am I in? There we go. So I want to see this blurriness here and then sharpness at some point. Okay. And again, this is a neat thing that we can do inside of, uh, of our program that allows us to do that. Um, so I'm depth of field. So I'm going to go to my focus distance here, and I'm going to click the arrow, and then I click on whatever I want in focus. So typically you want something um, like what's your main focal point you want in focus. So I'm going to use this stop sign as my focus point. And what that does is it automatically types in how far from the camera is that, un that item. If I move my camera now, then I would have to reset that position. Okay, if I zoomed back a little bit or in or whatever, I'd have to update that amount. Um, under physical, I'm going to then start taking this f-stop number down. Now, just for speediness, because I'm going to have a lot of iterations where I'm tweaking this, I'm going to take this um, width and height, and I'm going to lower this down drastically. So I'm going to say lock my ratio. And set this to 1,000. Okay. Now, before I do my final render, I need to come back in here and crank it back up. So I'm going to hit Control or um, Shift R so I can see it. And we're going to see that nothing happened. It looks exactly the same as it did before. Okay. Once we've gone and started doing some more advanced stuff, we're now outside the realm of Cinema's basic renderer. So I'm going to go to my render settings. 
and you'll see there's a standard renderer. Now we have to go to physical because now we're doing something that's a bit more advanced than just the basic steps. Still not getting anything there. Let me take this f stop number. Make sure I'm looking through that, which I am. All right, something I have clicked off or on. This is perspective, that's on. Shouldn't have to have movie camera on. Uh, I forgot to turn it on inside the renderer. That's why. So I turned on physical, but I never turned on depth of field. There we go. Okay, so under the physical tab, which we get when we switch it from standard to physical, I have to turn that on. So this will probably have crazy amount of, of depth of field because I just cranked up my settings like crazy so far. All right. So I don't need movie camera on. Um, let me set this to 0.1 instead of 0.01. Okay, still too much, 0.25. Let's jump this to two. And now we're starting to get something that's a bit more appealing. The idea is that you don't wanna go crazy with it. You wanna have something that looks set, subtle, like it looks natural, okay? Um, that looks pretty good like that. Okay, now you'll notice there's a lot of grain happening here. So in our render settings, um, our sampler is set to adaptive and it's set to low. So I need to make sure this is set to high sampling and the adaptive is fine uh, as long as I set that to high. Okay, so sampler qu sampling quality I set to high. And so now when I render this, that should help smooth that out. And again, because we've taken our settings up higher, it's gonna make that go slower, but it'll look nicer. So you can definitely see there's not any grain happening on this now. I mean, it's pixelated if I zoom in because we're, you know, we're dealing with so many pixels, but that definitely looks better than it did. And then once you have the basic setup for it, then you can see, you know, do I really want the stop sign to be my focal point? Maybe I want this building to be my focal point and everything else is kind of blurred around that. Because uh, the stop sign is actually pretty boring because it's like the only thing that's in the view right there. Now also pay attention to, um, my basic render view, this was 2400 or 3000 by 2400. It took a minute. This is 1000 pixels by whatever it figured out that other number, 800. Um, this is taking longer because we have that depth of field on there, okay? So that's why you wanna do all your testing at a lower resolution. Make sure you get it good and then you can crank the resolution up and then hit the render button and go to the bathroom or take a walk or something. So we'll just see what this looks like when it's done and how long it took. There we go. So this took a minute 15 to create that. So then what I would do is I would go in here, I would crank this back up. <clears throat> I would pick a different focus object because I really don't like that one. Uh, I think that building here might be a good one to use. And then I would hit my Shift R again and let it chug along. Now, if I took it down from 3,000 to 1,000, that's like 300% I've decreased it. So it's basically like, it's gonna take about 10 minutes probably for this thing to render out, okay? So literally hit the render button, take a walk, come back 10 minutes later and then check it out. Or as you're watching this, you can see, you know, are you liking what is looking like so far? Maybe you forgot something, maybe you missed something, maybe this, this light pole is like floating in the air, you need to fix it. So you'd hit escape, you'd fix it, and then you would, you know, do it again. All right, so I would let that one go, pretend that that one's done, and then I would save that image as a TIFF 
<clears throat> and I would call this one stylized environment now. I call this one depth of field, O2. And then I would move on to my next camera. Yes, sir. Yes. When is it due? Oh, the next Yep. All right. Um, now we'll have another one called Fish Eye. Let me look through my camera. And for this one, I'm going to go back to the physical. And you'll see that under the um, physical, there are these lens distortion uh, items. Now I'm going to crank these up as high as they go. Like that, I'm gonna. Oops. I'm gonna turn off my depth of field. Make sure I'm in my fish eye. And I'm also gonna lower my resolution because, again, doing this in a demo version this takes time to do. So I'm just gonna lower my resolution just so we can see it quicker. Now, what the fish eye should do is it should create that fish eye look which means that the center of it should be really like bowed out. Like it should look like the buildings are like warped around a circle. And you can see that's already what's happening here, right? That building is definitely rounded. <laughs> Looks like it's falling over. Now this may not be the best view for a fisheye. Once I turn my other buildings on, I'd probably have more of a view. But it's fine. I can move my camera. I can adjust where my camera is set up so that I can show maybe a better fisheye view. Maybe my better fisheye would be like right inside between these buildings. That might be a better shot to show the fisheye lens happening. Yep, cool. So pretending that this one's done, I would save it as OK. Fisheye. And this would be O3. Okay, now you can play with other stuff too, um, but these are the ones that I'm kind of pointing out. So if you, you know, you're online, you find a tutorial for something. If you find a tutorial online, you're like, hey, this is a neat effect of how they did this with the camera, feel free to experiment with it. That's, you know, what this is about. Um, oops. So then this one is going to be. Um, Sketch and tune. Okay, so we'll look through this again. So with sketch and tune, this one is an effect that we're going to add on to this. So under the effect inside the render settings, I'm going to go to oops, I have to go to um, standard because that's where it is, and then go to sketch and tune. Now this one should actually take less time to render out because of the kind of renderer that it is. While we're waiting for it, let's look at what Sketch and Tune is. Under the camera itself, under physical. So Sketch and Tune is this. It's like flat shading inside of Cinema. So this is an actual 3D model that they've rendered out using Sketch and Tune. And the neat thing is that you could also generate lines on here. So like this is also Sketch and Tune. And this is also Sketch and Tune. So it's 3D geometry that then gets rendered out to look like cartoony flat stuff. Well, those are actually drawings. So right now it's generating my lines. It's thinking about it. Uh, most likely you have to come into the line area and start playing with these to get the lines in the areas that you want them to be. Uh, whenever you do sketch and tune, it creates this as well, which is a sketch and tune shader that it drops onto all of the stuff in the scene. There it goes. So now you can see that we've taken our uh, environment that started off like that. And now it looks like this, OK? So if you were doing something like technical drawings and they needed, like, here's a 3D car and we want to see what it looks like with lines, boom, you could do that. Um, you can play with all these things of where the lines are. That's what these things are. So if I did intersections, anywhere two items intersect, it would create an, an edge, OK? 
Um, I could also say, you know, wherever there's an overlap or depending on the angle or depending on the material, it would create a different one as well. So you can play with those. I can also go to the sketch and tune shader. And inside here, I can play with the exact thicknesses. So here's the strokes. Uh, where's my thickness? There's the length, distance, angle. Where did that start? Color. There it is, thickness. So here's the thickness of those lines. So I can make it one, and obviously it would be thinner. You could also modify things based on distance, position, scale, illumination, a whole bunch of things, okay? The list is pretty much endless for this. Again, just you can go as far as you want with this. The default is add it, make sure it looks like Sketch and Tune, and then that one's good. So I would save this one as, as my full res, not the lower resolution. Sketch and Tune. Okay, now to go back to not having Sketch and Tune, I just uncheck it here. And then I can go back to, let's say, physical, and then go back to the physical render. Okay, so new camera. And this one is going to be vignette and effects render. Thank you. Um, so with this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I've turned off my vignetting or my lens distortion because that was still on. And I'm going to play with my vignette. So I'm going to take the intensity of the vignette up. And you should see pretty quickly what a vignette is actually going to do to this scene. Um, but basically it's this. It's just the darkening of the edges of our image, just to help draw our focus into the center of it. Let me take my settings down further here. Let me take this down to low. And again, this is just because I'm lecturing about it. If I'm doing these as my assignment turn in, I want this to be as nice as possible. So I keep the settings up to high. I keep my resolution up to 3,000. Okay. While you're doing tests, yeah, crank it low. Oops. Let's vignette intensity 100, and then let's do a 50% offset just to start. There we go. So now you can see the vignetting on here. Here it is without, here it is with. You don't want to be too crazy with it. Um, this is crazy. Right, because you can definitely see a line right there where the vignette stops, that looks weird. So find a good value that you know looks decent on here. Um, I also want to go to uh, my white balance, and I can change my white balance here. So let's say I set this to 2,500. This will actually tint what my scene looks like. So 2,500 is going to take this into more of obviously a blue. If I go further up above that, if I go to like uh, 8,000, I should get more of an orangish tone. Okay, so there's the blue, there's the orange. And there's my default. So you can definitely see how, like, even just right inside the camera, right inside this viewer, we can really set up some really nice settings for um, doing that. Um, oops. Let me save that one. Still image. And this will be our last one. Five. Uh, So it's a white balance and vignette one. Okay, um, here's some other stuff you can do too. So you can make like a 360 camera. So this right here is the same exact shot that this little camera would be able to take. So if I needed to do something like that, that I wanted people to be able to like look around my scene, I could do that. I could render out a whole movie where people could then like look around with VR glasses and see my scene, which is again, it's pretty awesome. Um, what else? Anything else cool? Yeah, there's so much stuff you can do inside here. You can add like fog to your scene. You know, there's a lot of like little neat things. All right. So I'm going to save this. Let me open up Photoshop real quick so you can see how you'd slap all this stuff together. Of course, let me save my work. 
Um, while we're waiting for Photoshop, make sure everything is labeled. So all my cameras are labeled. I can even put them in a group just so they're nicely organized and call them cameras. Yes, sir. A combined one? No, that's what Photoshop's for. Yep, so we're just going to take those five renderings that we did and just put them together in Photoshop. There it is. Uh, here, C drive, there it is. So I'm going to go into my stylized environment. Here are the five images I just rendered out. And I'm going to make a new document that is 15,000 pixels wide by 24 pixels tall. Make sure it's pixels, not inches or feet. I didn't think feet is a choice either. No. OK, so now that I've made that document size 15,000 by 2,400, I'm just going to go to each one, hit Control A, Control C, and then paste it in. Now, you shouldn't have to resize yours, but because I didn't render mine out at the full size, I'm resizing mine. So all five of those are the same size? The same, they can be the same pose or shot, yeah. or you can move it around. Okay. okay. Now, for each one of these, you want to also specify what it is. So I'm going to do a little text drop right here and say vignette and white balance. And this is something that if you're working in the industry and you have like a job where they say, hey, we need a car and we want it to look kind of, you know, futuristic and blah, 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 you'll ex experiment with a lot of different ways to render your stuff out. Uh, I'm going to pick a different color because that looks a little bit too flat. I think that's probably going to be the best spot for it in this picture. There we go. All right. So then I'll grab the next image. It doesn't really matter the um, order of them, except for your base one. I want that one in the center. There's my white balance. There's my sketch and tune. And if you have your text done once, then it's simply a matter of just copying it. And then maybe coloring it if it's, you know, obviously not visible. Check your spelling. Make sure you spelled words correctly. That's a no-brainer, but just in case. Uh, that one's good. Sketch and tune is in there. Here's fisheye. My depth of field. I must not grab the right depth of field. I'm going to close that one and just find my depth of field correct one that did render out. Oops, too far. All right, I'll stick with that one. And just for uniformity, I guess I'm making this one black. All the other ones are black. OK, and then I'm going to save this one as just a TIFF with my name on here, Sarcona Combined Environment. <clears throat> and 
and I will include all the layers. That way I have all the layers there in case, you know, if we decide to print them or something, we don't want the text on there or whatever. Cool. So now I've saved all my stuff. I've rendered out all my stuff correctly. Uh, we go to the P drive, we go to there, we go to there, we go to stylized environment. And then this is again what you're gonna be turning in. Okay, now my folder is gonna be smaller than yours because I didn't render stuff out at the highest resolution. So 192 megabytes is what it's currently at. Uh, my renders, just so you can see the size of these for, you know, future information, I guess. 158 megabytes for the biggest one. And then your re regular render should be about 20 megabytes. Okay, so if you're ending up with small images like this, you probably don't have the right resolution. So make sure you're obviously rendering at the correct resolution. Um, you shouldn't really have anything in there. Nope, okay. So then I can take all my renders and put them into the final folder. So that's where the final stuff goes. There shouldn't really be any textures in there, maybe a couple small ones if you needed to. Everything else should be set, right? So then that's what you're gonna drop into the turn-in folder along with your sheet. And that should wrap up this assignment. Just turning in your sheet with the assignment in the right folder. So remember on the Y drive on 2510, turn in, you'll have the turn in environment folder. Okay, so you just drop your folder inside here and then give me your assignment submission form. Okay, yes, Matt? It's due at the end of the hour, but I'm going to be going over the next assignment on that date. Oh. Okay. So just so you can start the next assignment or start thinking about it. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Okay.